Many thanks for inviting me to this exciting event. When a uh, lawyer takes the stage, usually the fun part is over. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize in advance. It's going to be a fun break, though, because there are going to be two other speakers. Um, at the same time, the intersection of law and artificial intelligence poses very important questions that are going to shape the future of mankind in the decades to come. And I uh, very much hope to engage you in this important debate. Now, we all know that artificial intelligence is rapidly change how we are living and working. Uh, routine tasks, both manual and cognitive, uh, will be automated. There are forecasts that robots, sometimes called embodied artificial intelligence, are going to take uh, almost one third of the jobs in traditional professions by 2025. Now, that is going to be something that is creating tensions with respect to the law, because law is made or was made by humans for humans. And questions are going to arise as to, for example, how to deal with robots. Great strains, in particular, are going to arise with respect to robots that are smart, that benefit from machine learning, that do unpredictable stuff Shall we, and that's a very fundamental issue, treat such robots like humans? Shall we accord them legal personality at some point in time? Now, it's clear that law is going to shape the future of artificial intelligence. What, what kind of uses of artificial intelligence are going to be permissible? The benefits and costs of artificial intelligence. What kind of products and technologies will be in use? At what prices? And I should like to discuss these issues by putting an example to you, the example of an accident that is caused by a self-driving car. Now, what you see here on this next slide is a screenshot from a video that I'm going to play in a minute uh, that shows a Google car that drives in Mountain View on the right-hand side and uh, wishes to move into the driving lane. And the video is shot from a bus that is traveling behind the car. And unfortunately, the car makes a mistake because the car assumes that the bus is going to let him in, basically, to the driving lane, and the bus driver doesn't. So let's see the video. <laughs> Okay, so the car was crashed and suffered some damage. Uh, the bus suffered less damage, though, and it was the first crash in which a Google car uh, reputedly was involved when driving on public roads. So, to carry on, what is the potential of self-driving cars and what are the legal issues that are going to arise in contexts such as these? Now, predictions are that 75% of cars will be self-driving in about 20 to 25 years. There are, of course, many positive developments associated with this, at least for or from the perspective of many. We are going to have much fewer car accidents and casualties. Uh, currently, we've got about 1.3 million lives that are lost on the streets worldwide every year. 90% uh, of these Fatal accidents are caused by human faults, about 9% by environmental conditions, and much less than 1% by technical defects. Now, assuming these cars work well, not like the Google car in this particular example, uh, we are going to see a dramatic reduction of the number of accidents. We are going to see an increased mobility of persons with disabilities, the elderly, and we are going to see a significant reduction in the opportunity cost of driving. Uh, most people spend, on average, more than four years of their lives driving a car. Now, they're not always driving a BMW, which, of course, gives you only sheer driving pleasure. They're driving other cars. <laughs> they're, driving, they're driving other cars and cannot do things that they might want to do when driving a car, like reading or talking and doing other productive stuff. Now, we're going to see fewer cars on the streets because of car sharing. People will own less cars, of course, than today. That is going to free up parking space. It's going to reduce travel time, especially in the inner cities, and fuel emissions. So this is all good. 
Uh, unfortunately, of course, there are negative developments as well. We're going to see unemployment of certain people that are employed in certain professions. The traditional taxi drivers will vanish. Bus drivers. Now, you may speculate that if the bus driver in our little accident spotted that this was a Google car, uh, he kind of deliberately moved faster and not let this Google car get in in order to, uh, oh, you know what I mean. And we are going to see, and this is an interesting topic, a potential higher risk of what's called high magnitude accidents. Because cars are going to be networked in the future. And if we've got a cyber attack, that might not lead to this one isolated event that we've seen in this uh, car accident with respect to Google, but we might see a big, big, big event where thousands of uh, cars crash at the same time. Of course, the odd small accident will also occur, albeit rarely. So then the question is, and I'm going to put this question to you now, and we're going to do a poll. The question is, who shall be liable if a, and that's a bit, an important assumption, if a fully autonomous car uh, that is self-driving causes an accident? And here are five possibilities. Nobody, the loss is where it falls, that's what the lawyers would say. The car manufacturer, the device producer, if the device producer is different from the car manufacturer, which can be the case, must not be the case. In Google, it wasn't the case. The car owner, there won't be drivers uh, in the future anymore. People just own cars, if they own a car at all. Or the car. Well, this might sound very fanciful. We hold the car liable. But it's not so fanciful as you um, think when you start reflecting on this particular issue. Now, here's a clipping that I took uh, that relates to an accident apparently that took place a year ago or so, a robot uh, that did some trafficking on the dark web was uh, arrested by Swiss police in St. Gallen. Uh, the robot bought a couple of ecstasy pills, also bought a fake Hungarian passport. Uh, so it was arrested and it was freed after a couple of months by the Swiss police, right? <laughs> Um, so what do you think? Who is going to be the person or the institution or the device that's going to be liable? What are we going to see here? Now, a majority, if I read this correctly, believes that the device producer, if different from a car manufacturer, should be liable. And this is a potential solution. It's not the solution that I'm going to think is a solution that should be adopted in the long run. And I'm going to make the case now for strict liability of the car manufacturer. And those people who work for BMW should not pay attention to what I'm uh, <laughs> saying right now, of course. So nobody liable, that's not a good solution, of course, because that means that expected accident costs would not be internalized uh, by the producers if we've got a defective car that causes an accident, which put up wrong incentives, of course, and also uh, we would then refrain from buying these cars if we weren't sure that in case they cause an accident and hurt us or cause some more severe damage, there wouldn't be anybody liable. So why is strict liability of the car manufacturer a potentially good solution? Well, strict liability means there's no fault required here. That means it's just the defective product that causes an accident which suffices to hold somebody liable. And I think this is a good solution because the manufacturer is best positioned to control the risk and balance the benefits and costs of the technology. Uh, the manufacturer has intimate knowledge of AI and intimate knowledge of what, what went wrong or might have uh, gone wrong. Now, this is seen, you can see this clearly with respect to the Google car accident. Google reacted when the accident happened by saying, okay, we acknowledge that there might have been some contribution on our side here because something wasn't perfect with respect to the programming uh, of our car. Now, if we didn't think strict liability would be a good idea, we could consider fault liability. The problem with fault-based liability is that we could hold the manufacturer liable only if fault were involved. And that would require the courts to make a judgment with respect to the standard of care. And given these issues, I think it's exceedingly difficult to come up with that particular judgment. Plus, uh, a fault liability regime doesn't control what's called the activity level of the producer of a potentially defective device, the amount of cars produced and sold, and this is also something we, want like, we would like to do, though. 
What about liability of the AI device producer? And uh, that's apparently the solution that you came up with in a majority would be the correct solution if that institution is different from the car manufacturer. Um, you could think that this is a good idea. On the other hand, the manufacturer is going to control the assembly process. The manufacturer is going to control how the system, the complete system, is being built and bargains at arm's length with the AI producer uh, supplying these devices. So I submit that the liability of the AI device producer is not the best solution, rather the car manufacturer. If we adopted this particular regime, I think we would need to adopt the mandatory product liability insurance regime as well, because if we had that magnitude of event which suddenly confronted the car manufacturer with huge, huge claims, it would be very, very difficult to then uh, keep that car manufacturer solvent, so there needs to be some sort of liability insurance which is mandatory. Now you might say this is something that you dream up as an academic, and this is true to some extent. On the other hand, look at this. Uh, this was a move that Volvo made a couple of months ago, announcing that it would take responsibility for the actions of its self-driving cars. I think this is a pretty smart move because it's a very strong signal to the market, a marketing signal basically, saying we have great confidence in our own technology and it's going to put a lot of pressure on the other manufacturers to follow suit. Because if you don't follow suit, apparently your technology isn't as good as the technology of Volvo, who can send this strong signal. Now if we move in this direction, there are two complications that I should like to deal with. Uh, to round up my talk, namely the activity level of the owners and how we deal with really smart cars and smart machines in the future. Um, what is important, of course, apart from the care that's exercised by the manufacturer, is the activity level of the owner. And the owner controls the activity level according to his or her personal preferences, uh, the business model. I mean, that's easy to see if you compare, for example, a taxi company and a natural person that owns a car. Uh, there are completely different business models and usage levels. And it's also clear that the likelihood of accidents depends on the activity level. So strict liability is a problem because strict liability of the car manufacturer ignores the activity level of the owner. So we might have to think about something that takes that into account as well. There are a couple of potential solutions here. One would be co-liability of owners depending on the activity profile, so a kind of 50-50 split. Uh, another one which I think is a little bit smarter would be that the car, when it is being sold, comes with a mandatory liability insurance and the premium is determined by a couple of factors such as the type of manufacturer, the type of car and the profile, usage profile of the owner or the user of the car. And things like that are also available and assisted, uh, by the way, by artificial intelligence. Look at this. This is called black box insurance. Uh, it's an English company that offers car insurance, and the insurance is um, tied to a particular device that tracks the personal usage profile of the car driver. So we get really uh, very smart uh, insurance rates that take the usage profile of the owner or user into account. Finally, and that may be the most intriguing problem, is how do we account for smart machine learning, that is to say, things that happen with the car that even though uh, people who create the car are very smart didn't foresee at the time. So manufacturers really cannot foresee every behavior of smart cars. And there is an argument that you could think of to the effect that that might be something that should lead us not to impose strict liability on the car manufacturer. But rather, and now I'm coming back to this example of the ecstasy pill buying robot, rather put liability on the shoulders of the car itself. That would mean basically treating smart cars like humans, according them legal capacity, personhood, giving them the power to acquire property, conclude contracts, etc. So is this weird? Is this science fiction? I don't think really. I mean, think about BMW. It's a stock corporation. A corporation is a legal fiction. 
course, there are humans, and the actions of humans are attributed to the corporation. But as we're going to see in a second, humans also in firms like BMW are substituted by robots more and more. Smart cars are capable of purposive actions. They exhibit what can be called moral or legal agency. We could ownership tie to a liability insurance regime like the regime that I've just suggested. And treating the car as a target of liability opens up all kinds of interesting new sanctions that we don't have right now, reaching from re revoking legal capacity to, to destroying the car, for example. So all in all, I conclude that in the medium run, strict liability of car manufacturers coupled with a mandatory liability regime is a sensible approach, and in the very long run, probably liability of the car itself. Now, as a lawyer, I owe you a solution, quote unquote, to the Google car accident problem. Based on these principles, Google should take liability to what has happened, unless it can be shown, of course, that the driver uh, committed some kind of wrong in what he or she was doing, which doesn't seem to be the case. Now, what I would like to do now is repeat the poll and see whether I've convinced at least some of you or whether I've put you off, basically, by what I said. So here is the poll again, and I would like you to again type this into your smartphone. Uh, who shall be liable if a fully autonomous self-driving car causes an accident? Yeah, great. So the car manufacturer comes up. The car manufacturer comes up with 60 to 70 percent. I stop here because I fear that my lead is going to melt down if you continue. That's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, two final words. The policy road ahead. I think the interaction of artificial intelligence and the law poses crucial policy issues in the decades to come that should have become clear. Now, there are a couple of intricate new regulatory issues that have huge societal impact, and I've touched upon only some of these issues. Another one, which I mentioned, I mentioned it again now, is the governance of firms. Firms are going to be managed more and more, not by humans, but by artificial intelligence devices. The funny thing about all this, the interaction of artificial intelligence and the law, is that, of course, the law itself is going to be influenced and is influenced by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will fundamentally change lawmaking and the legal profession. That means, for example, we are going to have expert systems with respect to specific legal issues, legal research and drafting, contract formation, etc. So what emerges on the horizon is something like this. We might get smart artificial intelligence-based tools to tackle the difficult problems, regulatory problems with respect to artificial intelligence that are on the horizon. So robots are going to regulate themselves. It's just a new form of self-regulation. It gets really mind-boggling. By the way, scientific research and writing can nowadays also be assisted by artificial intelligence. Uh, there is software out there that writes scholarly articles. Um, unfortunately, I did not find any that would have assisted me in the preparation of this little talk. It is all too human. That's at least what I believe, hence the shortcomings. Thank you very much for your attention.